Uh, Stephen Tyrone are out of the championship after losing by 113 to 111 against Donegal and Bally Buffet last Sunday. Mickey Hart, like he's been there so long at this stage, and his question or his management was certainly questioned after the game. And I think most notably because he took off the two lads who looked most dangerous up in the forward line, which is Darren McCurry and Derek Hanavan. Um, just even just the game itself, do you feel that Tyrone threw it away? And then we'll come on to Mickey Hart and his future. Yeah, look, Shane, I, I, I watched the game on Sunday uh, with the father-in-law, the father-in-law is a big Tyrone man. He, he would have played for Tyrone for, for, for the guts of a decade. And, you know, we were sitting watching the game and, you know, he was admiring the influence that Michael Murphy had on the game in the second half, you know, from a leadership perspective. Now, I know he didn't he didn't kick any wonderful points or anything like that, but some people that, that maybe looking in from the outside are only looking for that from Murphy. But Murphy's Murphy's leadership and the way he stood up in the second half and winning dirty ball and Lincoln play, and I just thought he, he was immense, you know, and it, I just probably felt that Tyrone, and I think I said this in the show, Shane, last week, that I felt they were maybe just lacking, you know, one or two of those leadership, you know, type personalities in their team. And, you know, for me, there was a couple of key moments in the game. Obviously, the kick out from Sean Patton uh, uh, to, to uh, Peter Morgan, who slipped in Langan for the goal. Like, it was a thing of beauty. It was an absolute thing of beauty. And it shows how much the game has evolved too, uh, Shane, when you can get a, a goalkeeper who gets a kick out away in such super quick time and from the moment it left his boot to the moment it hit Langan's boot was in under 10 seconds you know they cut Tyrone open for a goal but Tyrone knew this was coming they knew this was coming and, and but it's very difficult to defend against when you've got a goalkeeper who has the capabilities of Sean Patton to do that but I knew it was going to be a battle between Patton and Morgan for the kickouts and, and a real, you know, contest from, from a strategic point of view and how they were going to press. And I didn't think kickouts had that massive of an influence in the game. I, I think I said this to you during the week. I felt her own towards the tail end of the game. I could feel them getting a little bit etchy. You know, I could, I could see a, a sort of a, nearly a nervousness about them or an etchiness about them when they were snapping at chances. And, you know, they, they started to panic a little bit more and they kicked a lot of loose ball into Conor McKenna, who was 1v3 at times. And I just felt they lost their way a little bit. And I think part of that was she and, you know, the substitutions. Maybe knockout football had, had something to do with that. Maybe the fact that Mickey knew that this was last chance saloon, you know, throw the kitchen sink at it, make the changes. Because when things aren't going your way, I've been there myself as a manager at club level, at county level. When things aren't going your way, you tend to try and change things. And when it still doesn't go your way, you change even more. And it just becomes so disjointed. And I just felt that, that Donegal just showed a little bit more control, you know, a little bit more guile. They were a little bit more patient, you know. And listen, Ashin Gallen, uh, uh, you know, scored a brilliant point. He came off the bench, scored a brilliant point for, for Donegal towards the end, which, which more or less nailed it for them. But you know, for me at the weekend, the conditions obviously didn't help the game, Shane. Didn't help the game whatsoever. But you, you know, the the, the, the start Tyrone got five one up. Like I actually couldn't see any other winner. I just thought Tyrone. The conditions. Tyrone are a great team at retaining the ball. Their ball retention. I've always admired Tyrone's ball retention because they're obviously very, very well drilled, very well trained, and I just felt this could be a day for Tyrone conditions wise. But but listen, look, hats off to Donegal. It was always going to be a titanic battle, and it's a pity, Shane. It's a pity that, that Tyrone are gone because, to be honest with you, uh, you know when you look at the National League over the last number of years, for me, for me, there's a top four. There's a top four. I think Dublin, Kerry, Tyrone are there. You could argue who the fourth one is. I, I wouldn't even put the Connex says into it. I, I would probably go as far as saying Donegal, and I would say that's maybe your top four. And then there's another four, you know, and you know Mayo's obviously in there, Galway's obviously in there. You know, you could argue Monaghan's in there as well. But I just feel that, you know, we, we have now lost at one of the big guns now. Now is Donegal's opportunity. Can Donegal now push on? That's the big question. Can they really push on, you know, win this Ulster title and really put an assault on the All-Ireland? And I said in your show, way before a ball was kicked in the championship, I had a sneaky feeling that Donegal could be in the All-Ireland final. Uh, Sean Cavanaugh was asked on the Sunday game if he felt that it was time that Mickey Hart stepped away. He's been there since more or less the turn of the millennium, just 2003, uh, well, late 2002, I think is when he was appointed. He didn't really answer the question. Do you feel, looking on at how they're being coached with the quality of players they have, that they should be getting more out of him or that he should be walking away? I mean, it is 12 years since he won his third All-Ireland at this stage. Yeah, well, I suppose he's built a number of teams now, Shane. He's built a number of different sides. Uh, he's built a number of different teams. His record is... Um, is, is you know, it's, it's it's hard to argue against his record. We had a very similar situation at Down. Uh, you know, Pete McGrath obviously stayed uh, right up until 2001, 2002. And at that stage, the apathy for Pete had probably gone uh, from a lot of people, you know. And 
people saying it was time to go. It's very, very difficult for people to leave that behind. You know, it's very difficult for people to step away when it's when it's ingrained in them, when they've had success. You know, people won in all Ireland in 91 and 94, you know, which is absolutely, you know, it's, it's the last time we've probably had any any success whatsoever. And, you know, his record was unquestionably, you know, it was, it was the best, you know, that any manager had ever had with Down. But there comes a time when you probably need to know, look, you've done enough, you know, the, the players then... <laughs> I've yet to see anyone really come out player wise, even to come out in a negative sense about him, which 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 interests me. But I suppose but without afraid to say anything. wishing about him. Players are What's afraid. That, players are afraid to say anything in the modern world. Current players well, and, well, and ex players don't yeah. want to. Do you know? Like they would have soldiered with him, so they don't necessarily want to slate him. Yeah. Well, the one thing I would say, Shane, if we look over the last number of years, Dublin have been extremely dominant in this in this country. Okay, Dublin have been head and shoulders better than anybody else. But if you go back to two thousand and seventeen. Tyrone were beaten in an All Ireland semi final by Dublin. In 2018, they were beaten in an All Ireland final by Dublin. In 2019, they had Kerry beat out the gate last year. Beat out the gate in the first half, and a stray pass in the second half turned the game. From McGeary slipped the ball inside, Stephen O'Brien turned it over, and two or three minutes later, or two or three passes later, sorry, it was in the back of the throw net, and that spun the game. They were five points up against Kerry last year in the All Ireland semi final and had kicked a number of wides as well. Kerry looked out in their feet, and all of a sudden then, Kerry went from being dumped out of the All-Ireland to, geez, this Kerry team is unbelievable. You know, so football, there's a fine line. You know, what is success? If success in Tyrone is only winning All-Irelands, then obviously Mickey hasn't been successful. But if you actually look at the last three years, I can tell you now, as the down man, I would swap with them. I would happily take two All-Ireland semi-finals and an, and an All-Ireland final, you know, under the current management. So, I, I just think sometimes we can be very, very quick to say he has to go, he has to go. For me, would a change help Tyrone right now? I'm going to say probably yes, I think it would. And I think a change for everyone, I think it would give everyone a freshness, give everyone a boost, give everyone a lift. You know, he's been there a long time. He he owes the county absolutely nothing. You know, he's been he's been a remarkable manager, probably one of the greatest managers of all time because he is overseeing so many different what I would call evolutions in the game as well, Shane, you know, and, and we talked about his matchups, we talked about some of his strategic plays that he's pl- employed in the past and things like that as well. Plus as well, Shane, and, and I think it's probably, it, it would be unfair not to mention this, he's overseen his fair bit of tragedy too. You know, he, he's been involved in a lot of personal tragedies, a lot of tragedies within the squad as well, you know, even go back to Paul McGurr and Corbett McAnally, you know, his own daughter and stuff. And that, that, that is not easy for any individual, for any individual. It's not easy for any individual even to hold that together and still manage a football team and still manage at the highest level. And I think he deserves a serious amount of respect for that. You know, and, and, I, and I think, you know, someone made the point at the weekend, or I think it might have been Andy McGinley or someone, one of the articles, like, Mickey will go when Mickey wants to go you know and that's and I think that that's what's going to come out of Tyrone now is that you know it'll it'll be his decision when he goes and, and no one else is really but I, I think now after 17 years in the group of players that they have coming through I, I think maybe a, a freshness you know within the within the management team I think would, would maybe help Tyrone. And do you think that are Tyrone playing as modern a type of football as they can because sometimes you look at other counties hurling their football and you think geez they've good players and if only they had manager X did probably play a style that suits him a little bit more so the question is are they somewhat stuck in the past or are his tactics as cutting edge as they can be well you see it's very difficult Shane because Ulster football is so traditional so if you go in and Ulster football and play really expansive and really open you're probably going to get chinned you know and that's the problem you know I, like I said before I would love to see Dublin going to, to Bally Buffet in the first round of the championship rather than, than Mullingar with all due respect to Westmead uh, you know it'll be double figures at the weekend let's be honest so like you, you would you would love to see some of these other counties who even carry you know send Kerry up to Bally Buffet on, on a on a wet Sunday at the at the end of May or the start of May and, and see how they get on you know and I just think that people sometimes don't appreciate how difficult and how attritional Ulster is. Ulster has always been very parochial, Shane. It's always been very, you know, the football is, is it's, 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 it's do or die, you know, it's, it's a lot of passion, there's a lot of heart in it. And, you know, and I think that, that to play a certain way in Ulster, if you play a certain way in Ulster, you know, you, you will ultimately get success, you know, and I, I think I think we're probably a wee bit harsh on them as well because some of the football Tyrone do play at times is very, very good. 
but they're probably just a little too systematic at the minute. They're maybe just they're maybe just not playing enough. They're maybe not just playing freely enough. And I do feel that when you watch Tyrone club football and you look at some of the games in Tyrone club football, like some of the scores are, are, are some of the football that's played is absolutely excellent. And there is serious, serious forwards in Tyrone. And I suppose maybe it is a question of, of evolving and developing a little bit more. But then the flip side of it is, and you, you listen to McGuinness the other day chatting, you know, football teams are starting to evolve now. You know, the game is starting to change. Most teams are now pressing opposition's kickouts. You know, there is more of an intensity to press the ball. You know, there is there is less of, of what you would probably call, you know, real deep line defences now. It's more higher middle third presses. It's more it's more man to man. And and I do feel that football generally is is starting to evolve. And I and I seen signs of it, Shane, when Tyrone played Mayo. I did see signs of it and I, and I would love to have seen them get out of Bally Buffet and see if that football that they played against Mayo could have evolved a little bit more, but unfortunately we're not going to get to see that. Stephen, we know that Galway and Sligo has been called off because of the COVID cases in Sligo and they, they've decided to, to pull out. But the Ross Common versus Mayo match, that's going to go ahead. And Mayo haven't been in the Connacht final since 2015, which is fairly incredible. And I think that was probably the year they completed five in a row there. Whereas Ross Common, they've been in all of the last four, winning two and losing two against Galway. They beat uh, Mayo in the semi-final last year, 2-12 to 17. Is your sense that Mayo, the team that just got relegated from Division 1 or the team that just got promoted from Division 2, Ross Common, is in better shape coming into this? Yeah, you know, Shane, it's a very valid point because funny, when I was looking at the game today, I was thinking about this and I looked at Ross Common. You know, they finished top of Division 2 with a plus 23 score difference. Uh, you know, they obviously finished on 11 points as well out of 14, which, which I think they dropped two points in their first game uh and they drew their second game and then i think i think was common had four or five wins in the spin you know with, with really credible wins away to armagh and away to cavan obviously in the league which are not easy places to go to like athletic grounds is not an easy place to go to breffney park is certainly not an easy place to go to but if you take it i suppose that mayo you know relegated from uh, division one and Russ Common getting promoted from Division 2, there's probably not that awful lot of difference shame between the sides. Mm. And we probably look at Connacht, and we probably think of Connacht now as Russ Common, Mayo and Galway, and throwing a bit of a blanket across the three of them, and, you know, probably a kick of the ball between all three teams on, on, on any given day, albeit Mayo and, and Galway was a bit of a freak result this year in the National League. But last year's semi-final, obviously, you know, Russ, Russ Common 2-12, the odd 17. There's goals in Russ Common. And that's a key. That's a key aspect to their play. There's definitely goals in them. Uh, I've always been an admirer of them for the last few years. I, I went down to the Clannock Yale Club in Roscommon a couple of years ago, and I done a coach education day with them. And I think it's all Town Hardy's club. And you know, you can sense that there's a real pure footballness about Roscommon and the way they play football and the way they want to go about playing football. And Mayo are very similar. So I can see a very very open game. Uh, I can see a very high scoring game again. I think I think the game that Mayo had last weekend against Leitrim, I, I know Leitrim did not put much of a challenge up, but it was probably good for Mayo to dust off the ghosts of relegation, dust off that defeat against Tyrone, you know, get themselves back on track. And listen, Shane, winning breeds confidence, and it's very very hard to beat that winning feeling. And coming off the back of last weekend, obviously, will give Mayo a bit of a a bit of a bounce and a bit of a lift. But look, you know, the likes of Connor Cox and 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 Donny Smith and David Murdoch, like Roscommon, are full of fantastic footballers. There's no question about it. And we've spoken about Mayo. The one thing that I would probably say about Mayo from last year's Connacht semi final. They're probably they probably look a little bit different to Roscommon, and what I mean by that is, you know, they've they've obviously introduced a uh, Connor Loftus played middle of the field against Leitrim, which what he wouldn't have played last year. You know, you've got you've got Conroy playing there as well. You've got O'Donoghue at eleven playing as well. Jordan Flynn's playing an industrious role at, at wing half forward for Mayo, and I just feel, you know, looking in the, in, in the base to that freshness that Mayo have maybe brought in, I think will just probably be enough for Mayo to edge this at the weekend, Shane. Do you think? there's any possibility that Mayo might be throwing in too many new players at the one time like you named out a number of them there then throw in Owen McLaughlin and Oisin Mullen as well and obviously we talked last week about how uh, Lee Keegan you know maybe he's going to be corner back Kevin McLaughlin um, against Tyrone we saw him centre back is there a possibility of too many changes going on and not having some of the familiarity and muscle memory from previous seasons especially when we've had such little prep time 
Yeah, well, I think this year is probably a little bit different to previous years because you're still, for me, the, the championship this year. And if you look at the Donegal Tyrone game last weekend, it, it's not, it's not the summer months. It's not dry saw. The ball's not moving really quick. You know, it's 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 winter football. It's it's winter conditions. And I suppose you know the the, the couple of league games that Mayo will have had and the championship gaming in Leitrim. You know, the same as Roscommon. I suppose it doesn't probably it doesn't probably reflect a real you know sort of championship type conditions and the championship pressure that comes with no support. Like Shane, it can make a massive difference. If you have a full house on Sunday with 20,000 people, for some of those newcomers, for some of those new players that have come in, that can be a very nerve-wracking experience. You know, championship creates maybe a different type of feel. It's, you know, league football, as we know, is completely different for the championship football. The amount of players you see in the past who have torn it up in league football and haven't performed in championship football. But just this season being the season that it is, Shane, I don't think it's going to make a massive difference into what game it is and what game it's not because those new players now have a championship game under their belts and now have a championship win under their belts. You know, the only thing that I would just be wary about about Mayo is that Roscommon have serious... Uh, they have a serious level of threat, Shane. That, that you know, they, they do have that goal threat. Uh, they do have scores in them. And my only concern for Mayo is that if they leave themselves as exposed as they were against Tyrone, then we could find they could find themselves in prob- having problems. I do feel that Mayo will be able to kick 15, 16, 17 scores. There's no question about that. They will. But can they keep out that two or three goals that Roscommon have in them? And if they can sh- shut that down and shut that aspect of the, of Roscommon's threat down, then I think Mayo will come out on top. But they do have to be very careful, Shane. We looked at the clip the last day of, of uh, Conor McKenna kicking the ball into an inside two against her own, you know, of McCurry and of of, uh, of Canavan left 2v2. And Aidan O'Shea ignored his duties of getting back in there, filling a the hole, you know, providing that cover. And I just think they'll have learned from that. They'll have learned from that. Now, Leitrim probably didn't give them the, that threat or that danger, you know, to actually work on something like that. But I do feel at the weekend you'll probably see a little bit better organisation from Mayo defensively. Well, it's not that we that we may see it. We need to see it because if we don't see it, then Roscommon can cause some serious problems. I'm curious to know as a football coach what you make, what you make of the likes of Anthony Cunningham changing from one coach to the other. Now, we've seen Pat Gilroy going over to the hurling side with Dublin, we've seen James Horne was involved with Turlock Moore hurlers a couple of years ago. And Anthony Cunningham, he obviously got all the way to an All-Ireland final with Gary Castle in 2012. Now they lost that to Cross McGlynn. So it's not like he's, he's unused to it and he's living in that loan and you know, all that kind of stuff. But do you, what do you make of him as a football coach? Because when he was with Hurland for so many years, you'd wonder, you know, is he after missing out on your evolution of a coach? Yeah, well, I feel... For me, Shane, I suppose, you, you know, you look at the likes of Jim McGuinness, you know, successful coaches in the past. For me, good coaching is very transferable. You know, I, I've gone and I've taken I've, I've taken sessions with, with Camogie teams. I took a session with a, a Camogie club side a number of years ago who were contesting an All-Ireland, fin- an All-Ireland semi-final, sorry. And like, I was a little bit nervous getting into the session because obviously, you know, you're, you're taking a completely different code. But a lot of the games are very transferable. A lot of the drills, a lot of the skills are very transferable, Shane. It's the way you present as well. Obviously, as a coach, you know, you, you, you're still, uh, for me, you know, people would have, would have labelled me in the past as, as maybe being a, a bit of a defensive coach, you know, but I don't think you're a defensive coach or an offensive coach. I think you're a, you're a coach first and foremost, you know, and, and coaching is very unique. It's an art form, in my opinion, Shane, you know, a lot of coaching comes down to man management and how you deal with players and relationships you build with players and, you know, how you get players to believe in, in what you're trying to, to, to portray to them. But, Think of the likes of Paul Kinnock there in, in Limerick as well. Paul obviously comes from a very strong footballing background and would have would have played for, for Limerick footballers, you know, and Paul is obviously Limerick hurlers are now regarded as as being one of the, the most, you know, probably innovative hurling teams that, that the game has seen in recent times. So it does go to show you that coaches can make that transfer and can make that code. And to be fair to Anthony, I was a little bit when the appointment was made at the start, I had actually spent uh, an evening with Russ Common uh, a couple of years ago, just after Anthony Cunningham had been appointed, and it was down in Hyde Park, and there was 55 coaches at it, and it was their development squad coaches and their senior club coaches, and there was common a uh, county development officer had invited me down for an evening to do a session on transition play, and just the the, the little eerie wigging I was getting that night was that the the rumblings about it they just weren't overly mad about the appointment at the time. 
but Jesus, the proofs in the pudding last year. You know, they won a Connacht title last year, and and I felt. I, I've always enjoyed watching Russ Common playing football this last few years. I think it's been very refreshing, and he's playing football in the right manner with them. He's got them playing on the front foot. You know, they're pressing opposition kickouts. They're winning their own. They're being brave. You showed how brave they were against Cavan when they took that short kick out and built from the back, which which led to a goal chance. You know, and 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 they're taking risks. But I think the key thing in any in any sport in any environment, Shane, is that you surround yourself with good people. And he's obviously done that. You know, he's obviously got a good backroom team, a good coaching staff, and he trusts them. And the players have obviously put a lot of trust in him as well. I'm going to put my neck on the block and say Mayo here because when they play Roscommon and do or die games the last few years, you know, once it's all Ireland series, they tend to win them. And I just think the the knockout situation that's going to edge it for Mayo, I think they'll be fully up for it. What do you think? Yeah, listen, I've... I, I, personally, you know, I would like to see Roscommon win. Uh, you know, they've had a good season. They've been promoted from Division 2 in Division 1. I would love to see them stay in Division 1 next year as well because I think you just need that one year to stay in Division 1 and build, you know, and, and obviously get used to playing against Division 1 teams all the time. Just going up and down like a yo-yo probably doesn't help, but I just have a funny feeling this weekend that, that the bits between the teeth and I think that Mayo will just get over the Cork will play Kerry in the Munster semi-final on Sunday and I think many people will consider this the de facto monster final here it is knockout football which adds so much more to it almost nobody from the Kerry panel has been involved you know the last time that they lost to Cork which was in the Munster semi-final in 2012 there was a draw in 2015 I was down at Fitzgerald Stadium in Killarney and Fionn Fitzgerald hits a sort of a speculative effort that somehow ended up over the bar and Kerry won the replay what do you what do you think it is what's your sense of this one is it because last year Cork pushed Kerry so hard and scored those three goals running straight up the guts. Do you think there's any way that Cork are primed to actually shock Kerry, who are, you know, right up there as favourites for the All Ireland beside Dublin? Well, it's not good football, shit. You know, it's Cork versus Kerry. You know, never, never say never. But I looked at a few statistics earlier about the Cork team. You know, they have a plus forty four score difference with seven wins from seven in Division Three now. Division three and division one, there's a massive gulf, you could argue, you could argue. But at the same time last weekend we seen Cavan, who will be in Division Three next year, beating a Division One team in Monaghan. So, you know, you could probably argue that on the day, you know, Cork Kerry has that feel about it. Rona McCarthy, what he's done this year is he has flooded the, the squad with a lot of new faces. He's brought in a lot of, of the under-21 squad that would have won the All-Ireland last year. So that, that would have brought a freshness. It would have brought a confidence because when you're used to winning, you know, it creates a great confidence, Shane, and a great bit of momentum within the panel. And and football ultimately is a game of confidence. And listen, Cork have always had we, we played them in a minor match way back at the start of March in a minor challenge match up in Dublin. And I got off the, I got out of the car in, in uh, the, the National GA Centre in Dublin and this Cork team got off the bus and I was looking at them going like, Are we playing their minors or are we playing their seniors? You know, they they've always produced huge athletes, you know, really, really strong, robust footballers. Mm-hmm. But they've got a bit of class too, Shane. You know, they've got some really good footballers. The likes of Rory Gein and Paul Kerrigan the last day. Like Mark Collins came off the bench the last mm-hmm. day against Louth in the league and scored one five. You know, they've always had that those, those, those footballers. Cork's a massive, massive county, Shane. Massive county. You know, and obviously Kerry don't have the the, the, the distraction of playing hurling at the very highest level like Cork do. But you know, for me Cork have always been a county where you're just sort of saying to yourself, like, like what what is happening? You know, why are they not contesting every year? And maybe part of that has been maybe you know historically mental scars from from defeats with Kerry in the past. But if you actually look at it, ten years ago, you know there was a Cork team came through. They won the All Ireland in 2010. So it's ten years since it since they won the All Ireland. They beat down in the final mm-hmm. actually that year. But that was a Cork team that had been around in 08 and 09, and you know had been knocking on the door and they had some fantastic battles with Kerry. But this team for me, Shane, going in at the weekend, have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Now, Kerry will go in as massive favourites. You know, obviously Kerry's forward line, you know, Shawnee O'Shea, David Clifford. They've brought in Brosnan this year from Dr. Crooks, who's playing out of his skin at the minute. You know, we, we talked already on the show in previous weeks about the power that they have from their half back line and the likes of Tom O'Sullivan being able to go forward. But there's question marks over Kerry defensively. And it's been made public that there's been question marks over Kerry defensively now. We see it against Monaghan that they can adapt and they can play a, a bit of a deeper line of defence and they can get bodies back and they can sort of suffocate the game. But it'll be interesting to see how this weekend goes. 
yes, of course, Kerry are favourites in paper, but it is Cork Kerry. It's a Cork team who are coming into the game with a serious level of confidence, you know, with nothing to fear, with nothing to lose. And, and I can see it being a very, very high-scoring game. But just what you said there, I, I probably think if Cork are to win the game, they're probably going to need goals, and, and, and quite a few of them. If you, if you jump back to last year, when I was watching Cork come back from the, quali- or the loss to Kerry and go through the qualifier series, I saw them beating Leash down in Turles, and they battered them. And Mark Collins was on fire, Brian Hurley was on fire, Luke Connolly then, he, go- he goes and scores a goal after, what was it, 15 seconds of the game against Dublin. Yep. I can't remember if that was the first half or second half, but he had a goal very, very early in one of the halves. But <clears throat> Dublin managed to completely shut down Mark Collins, completely shut down Brian Hurley. Do they, like, they have a brilliant attack, um, exciting attacking line, but can they be shut down and do Kerry have the backs to do it? Well, this is this is the big question, and this is the question marks that have that have come about Kerry. You know, have Kerry got the personnel to go man to man at the back? And uh, if you listen to some Kerry pundits, particularly Tomas O'Shea, who would be very vocal and very forthcoming in his views, Tomas would say, "Look, defensively, we're just not good enough." You know, and he would say that publicly. And maybe that's why Shane against Monaghan. Maybe that's why they dropped off the odd kick out. Maybe that's why they they filtered back to middle third press and got a bit of cover on. You know, maybe that's why they, they they set up so defensively. Maybe that's why against the likes of Donegal, you know, they were happy to keep possession for long periods of time and and not turn the game into a helter skelter game. And you know that that's what teams want. You know, teams teams like that, that, that play like that. You know, that have a that have a have a forward line like carry. Like you know, they obviously they're reliant on 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 posting big scores, but. You, I think Jim McGinnis mentioned it during the week. There's got to be a balance. There's got to be a balance. Okay, so it can't just be all out attack. It can't be you know you score twenty two, we'll score twenty three. There's got to be stages in the game machine where you've got to control the game. You've got to shut the game down. You know you've just got to take the sting out of the game because physically it's just not impo- it's just impossible to go helter skelter for seventy minutes. And and I just I just do feel that Kerry have become a little bit more streetwise. I think they've become a little bit cuter. I think defensively they've become a little bit more switched on, and I think they're learning. I, I think they've definitely those last couple of league games. I know the Donegal games very very hard to analyze because you know it, it was a dead rubber, but they were going in a skein against the Monaghan team who were fighting for their lives, and they showed that they can play that way, and they showed that they can shut teams down defensively. You know, and I just feel that against Cork, they're not going to be silly. They're not going to be naive. They know where Cork's energy lines are. And you're completely right in what you say. Cork got a dream start against Dublin last year. I remember looking at it thinking, I think they were 7 six nil up, 7 nil up, I think, or 7-1 up, I think it was. And it gave them such a great opportunity, great foothold in the game. And and maybe, maybe just maybe, you know, that game against Dublin last year, the young lads coming in from the under-21 panel, maybe that will just give them a bit more confidence. But... I can't see past Kerry because I just don't think that Cork have the personnel, Shane, to be dealing with the forward line that Kerry have. And this year, particularly in the National League, I don't think Cork would have come up against anything. You know, well, well, it's not that I don't think, they just simply wouldn't have come up against anything, you know, as well drilled and as well oiled as this Kerry forward unit. I think an, an awful lot of this Kerry team you could probably pick at this point, Gavin White and Paul Murphy being the two wing backs, uh, Peter Crowley probably centre back. Maybe you're looking at Jack uh, Barry and David Moore in midfield. So I spoke with Darren O'Sullivan, the Kerry player, and there's an interview with him on our game today. And he was talking about the forward line. So if at the moment you're going to assume that maybe Stephen O'Brien would be the one wing forward, Sean O'Shea, this is assuming everyone's fit, Sean O'Shea is centre forward. Now Darren suggested Dermot O'Connor as the other wing forward, and you know Jack Barry would take midfield. So let's just assume that's the situation. The inside forwards then that they can pick, David Clifford, he's he's a shoe in Then you've got the options of Paul Ganey, who was the player that stood up in last year's All Ireland final when things were going wrong. You've got James O'Donoghue, former footballer of the year. You've got Tony Brosnan. You've got Dara Moynihan. What? Who do you pick? Oh, this it's just I'm, I'm I'm thinking I'm thinking from a Cork perspective here. It's like it's like pouring water into a sieve, and you're trying to plug this hole and plug this hole and plug this hole, and it's just physically impossible to do it. Uh, you know, obviously Clifford. You know, we we've spoke about Clifford Sheen. I don't think we need to say any more about the kid. Uh, I think this lad has the potential to become anything he wants. Uh, you know, I don't think there's going to be any any danger of David Clifford becoming too big for his boots or or developing an ego because I'm sure he'd be brought down a peg or two in, in, in that carry room, but. 
I, I just feel, you know, Tony Brosnan is just probably, Brosnan is probably just too good to leave out at the minute. His form is just it's top class. You know, he's come, he's come in off the back of a really good club season with Dr. Crooks. So it will be him. It will be Clifford. And then it's one other. It's one other, you know. And, and as you say, who you pick, does it really matter? You know, if it's if it's Gini or O'Donoghue, you know. And, and plus as well, and I think this is the biggest thing, Shane, as well. Cork have an impact, of course, coming off the bench with some of their long legs, some of their fresh legs, some of their athleticism. But if you're bringing in those guys, if you're bringing in a Paul Gini or a James O'Donoghue, when the game is really stretched with 20 minutes to go and you're a cornerback and you've just chased Brosnan for about 50, 55 minutes and he's, he's maybe pegged off 1-4, 1-5 against you and you see O'Donoghue coming in or Gini coming in, it's, it's, it's going to be a long last 20 for you, you know. So, listen, for me, it's, it's Brosnan, Clifford and one other, you know, and... and Take your pick. It has to be Ganey. Come on, I want you to Ganey. put the neck on the block. It has to be Ganey. If you're going to win all Ireland, you need a leader like that on the field. Mm. Yeah. So it's no, well, listen, that. listen. He captained his college. He captained his college to Sigerson Cup. You know, he's displayed leadership uh, capabilities in the past year, and there's no doubt about it. And he's got a wealth of experience. And I, I rate the lad. You know, he's a brilliant footballer, a really, really top class footballer. And you're probably right in that respect. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are you going with Kerry? I'm going to go with Kerry myself. Well, yeah, absolutely. I can't go with anyone else. But listen, I, I think it'll be a good game. I yeah. think it'll be a good game. I think it'll be an open game. And, and I'm hoping for... Stephen, your native down are going to visit Fermanagh this weekend at uh, Brewster Park. What are you expecting from this game? Because down obviously got promoted up from Division 3. Fermanagh will be going down the other way next year. And obviously there was all that COVID situation with Fermanagh where they sent a weakened team down to, to Clare. So maybe they don't fully know where they're at. Maybe their preparation hasn't been great. So, what are your thoughts on this one? Well, I'll probably start with a few statistics, Shane. You know, down, which is probably unheard of, with the lowest scoring team in Division 3 last year. Uh, Fermanagh with the lowest scoring team in Division 2. And, uh, you know, I think it's only, it's only London, Waterford and Carlo have actually scored less than both sides in the, in the whole four divisions, which, for me, from a down perspective, is very concerning because we do have serious forwards in the county. We've got really good attack and talent within the county, but... I feel at the minute, Shane, we're playing a very, very cautious brand of football. And, and, and I mean that with the greatest respect to Paddy. I think we need to be braver. Uh, I think I think we need to play in the front foot a lot more. And I think when you look at our kickout strategy, you know, my worry for down at the weekend is that, that our kickouts over the last two years haven't really evolved. And we seem to be taking a very cautious approach where we kick the ball into a block of four men and towards the sideline. And, and it probably cost us promotion last year against Louth, you know, and, and I just think, I just feel that, you know, I'd love to see the shackles off a little bit because I think this is a Fermanagh team that's slightly fragile. Uh, I don't think they're as well organised. I don't think they've got the same personnel as they had when they got to the Ulster final under Rory Gallagher. Uh, I think it's it's been a difficult year for for Ricey, you know, and listen, be under no illusions, he'll, have, he'll still have them well organised, but... You're looking at a leash team you know, that was minus uh, Tony Kingston and Evan O'Carroll and they still put 3-13 past them at the, uh, at the last league game. And I'm sort of thinking to myself, look, you know, Down have, have seriously uh, top calibre of footballer. And in my opinion, you know, much better footballers than Leash. So, like, if, if Down could go at the weekend, be really positive, Shane, play in the front foot and really get after from Anna early, you know, hunt their kickouts down, get our own kickouts away really quick. Let's try and build from the back. And I just think, you know, if we could do that, then I, then I can see a, a victory for down. But if we take that cautious approach and keep Fermanagh in the game and it turns into a real attritional affair, like if you, if you look at it, like Fermanagh have probably only averaged about 11 or 12 points throughout the course of their league games. But but the worrying thing for me is that down have done the same. Yeah. And how would you like to see down play? Who would you like to see the, the game plan built around? Well, obviously, listen. We've got what we have in the team is is we've got we've got some phenomenal pace. We've got some great young footballers coming through in the county as well. Obviously, the last day against Louth, some of those players seen a bit of game time. But the likes of Sheila Johnston got a bit of football. Young Shane Annett from Mayo Bridge. These are young lads coming through at 19, 20 years of age, Shane, who've got serious potential and, and, and serious talent. But they're coming out of clubs. But no fear. Either. These young lads, you know, like Sheila Johnston played a pivotal role for Kilku this year. He's the brother of, of Ryan and Jerome. But Jerome had a great season in. in club football this year uh, Shane Jerome Johnson was probably the best inside forward and down this year and you know Jerome will, will definitely play Barry O'Hagan from Hilltown will play you know you're probably looking at Don O'Hare from Burn as well but you've got the likes of Mooney you know Keelan Mooney if Mooney stays fit you know Mooney's got he's got just blistering pace uh, you know I, I just think of the, the qualifier last year against Mayo and Nuri where a couple of times he burst through the middle and it, it just it, it's just 
physically impossible. I've seen him at club level, I've seen him at county level. He possesses that much power and that much pace. It's just sometimes so difficult for just to keep a handle on him, you know. My only concern is that Darn O'Hagan's missing at the weekend. Darn is, you know, Darn's our, our leader. You know, he, he is he's the heartbeat of, of Down and he has been the heartbeat of Down for the last number of years. For me, Darn's one of the best He's one of the best defenders in Ulster, you know, not just in this county. He is the best defender in the county, but he's he's had crippling injuries now, and he's 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 had a couple of operations recently. So Darn will miss the, the championship, unfortunately, and he's a huge loss. Not even so much Shane, you know, from from the, what he can do on the field. He obviously can tag an opposition's best player. You know, he can go in the front foot. Darn can do literally anything that you want him to do, but. He displays great leadership and he's got that tenacity, he's got that hunger, he's got that drive. And even when things are going against you, he'll go in, he'll win a 50 50 ball, he'll win a 40 60 ball, and we'll miss that at the weekend. My other concern and my other fear is probably the middle of the field. You know, I just don't think we've settled now in two years on two settled midfielders. Connor Poland, a, a past pupil of mine, Connor would have won an All Ireland with, with St. Clements Kilkeel uh, under myself back in 2007. Connor displayed serious potential at that, at that age, at 16, 17. Played in a down team that won an Ulster title in 09, under 21 Ulster title. But Connor went to London for five or six years and, and, and sort of came out of the game a little bit. And, you know, he's got himself in very, very good physical condition. And you've Johnny Flynn in there as well. But, just middle of the field, it just be a wee slight concern over the last couple of years. I think it's an area in which in which we have struggled. So if we can if we can win the middle of the field, win our battle in the middle of the field, you know, get our restarts away really, really quick and get that ball in early to our forward line, I think will cause Fermanagh serious problems. Now. Has there been much of a change in how Fermanagh played between when Rory Gallagher left and now having in um, in Brian McMenamin? Like have you seen noticed any very diff, diff, uh, definite change in them? Well, someone said to me, Shane, Brewster Park plays. We were due to go to Brewster Park two weeks ago with the Miners, of course, uh, to play for Mana as well in the championship. And uh, we have a team we have a team that, that, is, that has got a good bit of pace, a lot of mobility. And we were sort of told, look, you know, be careful this time of the year. Brewster Park plays very heavy. You know, it's a heavy pitch at this time of the year. And that would probably sort of suit for Mana a little bit more because they do have a lot of strength. They have a lot of, they have a lot of physicality. And Shane, I don't think Ryan McMenamin is going to go in into Fermanagh and try and change an awful lot. You know, I've seen clips of their games. I've seen little bits and pieces of them. They're still well organised. They're still very defensively set up. You know, they're set up to, to play uh, probably a very, very rigid defensive system, Shane. You know, deep line defence. They'll crowd their space in their own half. They're not silly. They'll know what down will bring. They'll know the, the pace and the energy that some of the down forwards possess. But I, I just feel that if down can get ahead early in the game, it's very difficult for Fermanagh then to come out of that system, Shane. You know, and, and I think when it's ingrained in you for so long, because even before Rory Gallagher came in, Fermanagh would have played, you know, quite quite defensively, not as defensively as when Rory was there, but they would have played, you know, reasonably defensively before that. So I think I think it's still ingrained in them. I think they're still playing that way. They like to keep possession of the ball for long periods of time, which can be frustrating for an opposition, and particularly for a team like Down, who like to play on the front foot, who like to play, you know, what I would call probably a time sporadic football, you know. But I, I just think Shane, I would love to see a performance in Down at the weekend where 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 we're kicking two fourteen, two thirteen, you know, two fifteen, or whatever it happens to be, because it's in us, it's in us, you know. And and I think the way the game has evolved now that. And I've said this before, and it's been labelled at me in the past about being defensive and stuff. But you know, I'm evolving too as a coach, and and I see things happening in the game. And I think the days of you know of really playing a lot of bodies behind the ball. I spoke the other night. I was doing a little thing for Kieran Daly, and I spoke about it. I says like, you need at least three or four left up now, Shane. You need to give the opposition. You need to pose the opposition a threat. You know, and just far too often this year, I've seen down with 14, 15 behind the ball. Hence why we're one of the lowest scores in the division now. And the flip side of it. We've got the best defensive record in the league. You know, we've only conceded 85, 85 points. But still, you know, I think to, to progress and win and get to an Ulster final, we're going to need to open up a wee bit. And do you think Down will come through this game? I'd be very, very disappointed if we don't. But I, I, I think if we can get a good start on Sunday, get a bit of confidence going, you know, I think we'll come through the game and I think we'll come through with a bit of... Cavan play Antrim in the Ulster Championship this weekend. I'm sure you, you got to see it, Stephen, the dramatic victory for Cavan, 215 to 117, and Raymond Galligan's last second free from 55 metres out, whatever it might have been. After winning that, to come around a week later and then have to beat a team that, you know, the rest of the country will just be assuming that you're going to come through. And, you know, I mean, they got to the Ulster final last year, so everyone will just assume that Cavan will keep turning on. But it's going to be hard to turn it around in a week. 
Yeah, listen, it, it, it's Shane at this level. You know, there's no easy games, and you know you don't know what conditions are going to be like. You don't know how, how breezy it's going to be, how wet it's going to be. Uh, you know, Antrim are obviously coming in off the back of, of a really, really positive performance against Waterford. Now, they went to Wicklow the week before and they conceded six goals. And it was, you know, people were talking about one of the worst results in Antrim's history the week before, you know. But they come around and, and they had the high profile sort of, you know, game against Waterford where Waterford had refused to travel. They had offered at the game in the dock and stuff. But they, they went and put on a decent performance. But for me, Shane, you know, Galligan's kick was. Was, was I mean, Gallagher's kick was absolutely brilliant. It was a serious high pressure kick in the week before. I think I was I was giving him a bit of stick about uh, not clipping the ball to his corner back in one of the games that he played against Roscommon. So he he fairly answered me and shut me up with, with, with a score like that. But no, but on a serious note, what what impressed me about Cavan was Shane. They learned from the Roscommon game and they had their homework done in Monaghan and. I personally feel Monaghan were their own worst enemy Shane last weekend I thought they, they rested on their laurels too much in the second half and I was chatting to Conor Lavery actually on Monday and I was you know I, I said to him I said look I'm disappointed for you of course but they had goal chances in the second half Shane and I felt they were just too casual oh, in taking their points. over the bar it was driving me insane you and know for, what I mean and, yeah. and I can see I can see what they're probably thinking keep the scoreboard working but if you're playing against a strong breeze and you get those goal opportunities a goal just kills Calvin yeah. like, a goal ends that game it just ends that game there's no like for me the arse falls out of it for Calvin if the goal goes in at that stage you know and Monaghan they just felt well we've done enough and all of a sudden, you keep the ball, you keep the ball, you keep the ball. They had nine possessions, Shane, in the second half, lasting 60 seconds or more, and they get no scores from it. Now, that's that's a very, very energy-draining situation for a team who's just retained the ball. But it's also a very energy-positive thing for a team who hasn't because you're thinking, right, look, they're keeping us in this. And all of a sudden, then you get a point, you get two points, you get three points. All of a sudden, it's back to a score. And out of nowhere, the game turns on its head. And see when it went to extra time. I could only see one winner because Monaghan just looked they just looked so deflated. And, and to be fair to Cavan, they had a very, very strategic ploy on kickouts. They were going very long and direct to Gerard McKernan at 11. And it worked so many times for them. But they also dropped off Rory Beggins' kickouts. But Rory Beggins still insisted on going long. And it was an interesting strategy because I felt that when Cavan dropped off, Began could have gave that ball to the corner back. And what Began could have done was Began could have come out and joined the play created an overload, created a plus one, and maybe try to run at Cavan a bit more through the hands, you know. But they they decided that they would try and go long anyway. And what that meant was Cavan were flooding the middle third, and they ended up actually turning a lot of Monaghan kickouts over as well. So they were winning their own, and they were breaking even on Monaghan's, and it gave Cavan a great platform to build from. But look, this weekend, they're playing an Antrim team who I have always, and I mean this genuinely, have always admired Antrim for the standard of footballer and the quality of football that they have. Antrim footballers, like, I, I, personally, I'm just going to call it, I think they're underachieving. I think the county at football level is underachieving. They're a massive county. You know, they've got the boost this year of, of finding out that, that Casement's going ahead. That should give the whole county a lift. But Shane, you're looking at footballers here who have won Sigerson Cup medals. You're looking at footballers here who have all played Sigerson Cup football. The likes of, of, of Paddy McBride, the likes of, of the Murrays, the likes of McCann, the likes of Paddy Cunningham. These boys are all very, very good footballers. The only problem is that they're very reliant on Paddy Cunningham, who is at the stage of his career where he maybe cannot for 70 minutes sustain the energy levels and the high pace of the game. Now, Paddy must be 35, 36 and it is very difficult to sustain those levels, but put a ball in a plate for him and he will score. Now, for me, uh, Matt Fitzpatrick is probably, he is probably the, the, the best footballer in the county, but unfortunately, he has not made himself available this year and he's, he's a massive loss to them. He's a massive loss to them. He's obviously playing semi-professional soccer for, for Glenavon now, but he, he's a huge loss for Antrim, a huge loss, you know, and get into the game, do Antrim have their best the best 15 players in the county playing on Saturday or on Sunday, sorry, they probably don't. They probably don't. But what they do have, they've got some really dangerous forwards, you know, and if if things were to fall their way, yes, they could pose threat. They could pose a threat for Cavan. But I think after last weekend, Shane, there's not a chance that Cavan are going to win this game with any complacency.